On the 24th of January, 1941, the body of Jocelyn Hay, the 22nd Earl of Aaron, was discovered in the early hours of the morning at a deserted crossroads in the Kenyan capital of Nairobi. Found slumped in his car with a single bullet wound to the head, his murder would send shockwaves through Kenya's notorious Happy Valley set, a colonial community made up of aristocracy and society's wealthy elite. You have all these figures who are all assembled there because for one reason or another, none of them are in a position to hack it back in Britain. Who had killed him? And what reason did they have for wanting him dead? There were stories about him having mothers and daughters on billiard tables. It was in trying to get to the bottom of this crime that the lid was lifted on how this African outpost of the British Empire had become a playground for royalty and the aristocracy. Notorious for its lethal mix of drink, drugs, and sex. This was a seriously racy, seriously naughty place. With the drug addictions, the morphine, the cocaine, with the alcohol, with the wife swapping. To this day, the murder of the Earl of Errol has officially remained unsolved, with his killer escaping justice and the death penalty. But there are those who believe they have uncovered new hard evidence that proves exactly who it was that murdered the Earl of Errol. I've kept them at home here because they're quite in inflammatory, what's said on the tapes. It does name somebody as implicated in the murder. Just how did the 22nd Earl of Errol come to be found shot dead in his car on a remote road in the Kenyan capital? Known for his lavish party lifestyle, sexual promiscuity and countless infidelities, the Earl was no stranger to making enemies. Could it have been one of the wealthy women whose money he had frittered away? an obsessed former lover, or perhaps the husband of one of the many wives that Errol had seduced. Jocelyn Victor Hay was the 22nd Earl of Errol, one of Scotland's most distinguished titles. Educated at England's prestigious Eton College, Hay carved a controversial image from a young age and was expelled from school after only two years of attendance. His father held the post of High Commissioner in Berlin, and Joss was expected to follow in his footsteps and seek out a political career. It's hard to think of a better connected person in British society than the Earl of Errol. The Errol family are an incredibly old family. As the High Constables of Scotland, this honorific title they hold, they've been walking immediately behind the monarch in coronations since 1315. That's 600 years at the very apex of British society. And in the form of Jocelyn Hay, the Earl of Errol in this story, you've got the very embodiment of the loose, glamorous figure. He'd had a very checkered school career, and subsequently, he was a very wild child, wild young man, into women, and his family didn't really want him around. At the age of 22, Errol had become infatuated with a wealthy married woman several years his senior. 
In 1923, the Earl of Errol married a most unsuitable woman, um, Lady Adina Sackville, who'd been married twice before. Very attractive and very experienced, twice married, older than him. The couple scandalized English society. They weren't welcome at Royal Ascot. They weren't really welcome anywhere. Finding themselves ostracized, the couple looked for ways to escape the judgmental eyes of British society. So when the opportunity arose, they jumped at the chance to start a new life abroad. Supposedly in her divorce settlement, she was getting half of a 2,500-acre farm that she was going to move back to, to the Kenya colony. And so I should think that was rather an attractive proposition for him. If you had divorced twice, you couldn't basically stay in the United Kingdom. So where's the obvious choice? Go to the colonies. What's the best place to go? Well, Happy Valley. So that's where this couple end up. Errol and Lady Edina moved to Kenya in 1924. As he was penniless at this time, the move was financed entirely by Edina. Before long, the pair were enjoying all the trappings that Kenya had to offer and were soon well established among the notorious community of expats known as the Happy Valley Set. Happy Valley was a name given to a very remote valley in the Abadair Mountains called the Wanjohi Valley. Happy Valley Set was a group of mainly aristocratic people. It is this sort of kind of enclave at the time of, of Britishness. Um, and it, it's therefore, it's a place where you have all these figures, uh, these very loose figures like Errol, who are all assembled there because for one reason or another, none of them are in a position to hack it back in Britain. Well, it was Idina mainly who threw the wild parties which they went to, which were sort of orgies of drugs and swapping husbands and wives and alcohol. And so their, her parties were infamous. Happy Valley, as it became known, is roughly 100 miles from the Kenyan capital of Nairobi. Here, Errol and Edina built a house which they named Slains after his family castle in Scotland. Juliet Barnes is a Kenyan-born author who grew up surrounded by the stories and legends of the wild parties that took place here. So this is Slains. Idina began her Happy Valley parties here, so this was where they swapped partners and took drugs and drank too much and everything got a bit out of hand. Most of the house has now been lost to time and the elements. But the stories of what took place here have still managed to survive. I dare say everybody arrived with a few crates of champagne and Idina probably got the booze and drugs in beforehand. This would have been a long front room with fireplaces, which would have been the living room and the dining room at that end. And her bedroom would have been this side, where all the honeysuckle is. And there would have been a bathroom here. And this is where she apparently had a green onyx bathtub in the centre of the room, which was the beginning of the evening's games. She would take her bath and she'd invite her guests in for cocktails and they'd all sit round while she took her bath. So that was the warming up for the night ahead. Errol and Edina became infamous for the parties they threw at Slane's which were known for their abundance of alcohol, drugs, and sexual freedom. Some of the most regular guests there were the likes of Countess Alice de Jeanze, 
Molly Ramsey Hill, and Dickie Pembroke. If these walls could talk, I should think what they say would be X-rated. Apparently, there weren't any roof partitions, there weren't any ceilings, so you could kind of hear everything that went on in these old houses. Nothing was very private, which is quite a frightening thought, considering the sort of parties they got up to. One of the highlights of their parties were the games that Adina would insist on playing. Lady Adina had almost complete sexual control over the Happy Valley set. And she did it through playing this game with a feather. She just had this very light, small feather, which she'd hold in her hand. She'd stand in the middle of a circle, and she'd just blow the feather into the air. And whichever way that feather blew and landed, whoever's feet it ended up, that's the person she would sleep with that night. Um, Edina was the ringmaster of the Happy Valley set. That was her role. In many ways, it's just kind of like a 1970s, you know, spin the bottle or car key game. But of course, this is Happy Valley, and everyone there is in black tie. They're good looking, they're glamorous, they're rich. Um, so therefore, it seems far more glamorous and kind of not quite as seedy as one might imagine. The Happy Valley set had started to become known for their hedonism and complete disregard for the strict moral rules of polite society. Uh, I think they were very self-absorbed as well. I mean, very few of them actually did anything serious like farming. Uh, it was all about having a good time, the next party, drinking, dancing, and that was their life. It was said famously that there were three vices that all the Happy Valley Zets succumbed to. Altitude, alcohol, and adultery. And people like Errol did all that in spades. Errol had garnered a reputation for sleeping with other men's wives, a habit that would go on to have fatal consequences. This was a seriously racy, seriously naughty place. Um, by day, you'd be playing polo. By night, you'd be um, sleeping with your friend's wife. You'd be beating your servants. You might be injecting yourself with cocaine. You'd be getting rip-roaringly drunk. Um, and you would be burning down the piano in the club because you'd once heard that Jews might be admitted to it. I think the Happy Valley set were notorious because they were so unashamed about the wife swapping, certainly. And I don't think it was just wife swapping. With, with the Earl of Errol, I think he had anything that moved if she was rich enough and slightly older than he was. You know, there were stories about him in the Mutega Club, the social club in Nairobi, that he was having mothers and daughters on billiard tables. Um, this would not go down well at Government House in Nairobi. And, and Edina was, was blacklisted several times, you know, that she wasn't welcome in certain places that were classed as quite respectable. The majority of people in the colony were just trying to get on with farming and worked really hard and thoroughly disapproved them. They were quite different from the rest of the British in Kenya. Farming in Africa is a very difficult business and a lot of farmers went broke in the Depression uh, and it was a very hard life. Farmers worked hard, vets, school teachers, engineers, all sorts of British worked very hard and they tended to look askance at all these people known as veranda farmers, people who just sat on the veranda and never actually did anything and they were not liked at all for that reason. But endless parties and keeping up with that kind of lifestyle wasn't cheap and the Earl quickly ran up debts. His wife, Edina, also believed that her husband had been cheating her out of money and divorced him in 1930. 
Errol's first marriage to Edina broke up because he was a terrible womanizer uh, and he spent all her money and after which she got fed up with it. I mean, I think it was actually not entirely his fault. She got utterly fed up with his philandering, but she was doing the same. And, you know, she was very, as they said, handy with the needle. Um, you know, they were importing and taking cocaine, and uh, it was quite a drug fueled society that that little group had. I think it's fair to say that, that Edina split from Joss Errol rather than vice versa. Um, she said that she f could forgive affairs, but what she couldn't really forgive was him falling in love. And he fell in love with a married lady. And it was all very public and, and would have been quite humiliating to somebody like Adina Errol, who was a very beautiful woman. But it didn't take him long to find comfort and financial support elsewhere. He soon married Molly Ramsey Hill, a wealthy divorcee and fellow member of the Happy Valley set. Together they continued their lifestyle of promiscuity and decadent excess. He married Molly Ramsey Hill, I think, for her money, because he was actually running short of funds at the time. But he didn't find her a satisfactory or particularly attractive wife. She wasn't particularly beautiful. He liked beautiful women. So it was, it was a very unhappy marriage, that one. It was apparent um, almost from the moment that the Earl of Errol married Molly Ramsey Hill, that it wasn't going to go well. You know, she was a wealthy woman, that he went after wealthy women. He had to because he didn't have too much capital himself. Um, the fact that he drained her money in a very short time, the fact that she drank and was seen to drink herself stupid and also take heroin, it's a very extreme response to, to your husband treating you badly, but he must have treated her very badly. She wanted to give birth to a new Earl. She couldn't do that, so she took to drink and drugs. And Earl got so fed up that he told the house servants to give her all the drink she wanted in the hope that she might die. And the sad thing is, in August 1939, she did die of drink and drugs. The doctor said that her room smelled of vomit and champagne, um, which, which is probably quite indicative of, of the Happy Valley set. You know, there is the glamour that we all adore, the champagne, and then there's really the, the quite seamy side that was most unpleasant. Single once again, Lord Errol turned his attentions to another married woman, the wife of a fellow peer and newest member of the Happy Valley set, Sir Jock Delves Broughton. Jock Broughton was a hereditary baronet old Etonian, ex-guards officer, very rich uh, and immensely stupid. Uh, he was an old man of 58 when he fell in love with Diana Caldwell, who was a young blonde in her 20s. Lady Diana Dells Broughton was a beautiful divorcee who had met Sir Jock in South Africa before moving with him to Kenya. He was entranced by her youth and good looks. She was impressed equally by his money, uh, and it was a marriage that was never going to last. She, of course, was coming along as his pretty young wife, coming along for the ride. 
But Diana was uh, said to be a bit of a fortune seeker and a title seeker. I would imagine that, that Diana Caldwell saw in Jock, she, she saw pound signs in her eyes. Perhaps wanted the title, wanted to be Lady Delves Broughton, and, and which she became. Diana had first met Errol at the Muthega Club, an exclusive country club in the heart of Nairobi. They were introduced by Sir Jock himself, and it was an instant attraction the start of a series of events that would result in Errol's murder. Diana's affair with Errol almost starts as soon as these two meet each other. Diana says at that meeting, I was suddenly aware that I'd instantly become the most important thing in his life. So it, it was obvious that they had immense physical attraction towards each other. He sidled up to she and said, who's going to tell Jock, you or me? And this was before they'd even danced, touched, kissed, anything at all. Errol soon set about trying to seduce Lady Diana. And it didn't take long for her to succumb to his advances. They were soon involved in an illicit affair. And so they start this very, very passionate relationship that Sir Jock, Diana's husband, is 100% aware of. Now, under the mores of the time, you could have an affair in Happy Valley with someone else's husband or wife, but what you, you shouldn't do is rub the uh, third party's nose in it. You know, the gentlemanly or ladylike polite thing to do would be to do it discreetly. Everyone knows it's going on, but don't show off about it. Sir Jock was being publicly humiliated by his young wife and her new lover. However, before their marriage, Jock had agreed to a rather unusual arrangement with Diana. He was a rich old man, she was young, and so he agreed with her that if she fell in love with a younger man, he wouldn't stand in the way of a divorce, and he would provide her with an income of 5,000 pounds a year, which was an enormous sum at the time, for seven years. It was almost as if he was simply paying her while she was on his arm to be his attractive young wife in tow. Uh, and it may be that he made that offer in order to persuade her to marry him in the first place. Not only was Sir Jock losing his wife to a younger man, but he was going to have to pay her for the privilege. But true to his word, Sir Jock did not stand in their way. Jock Delves Broughton had suffered many humiliations already, you know, bearing in mind he'd only been married for about two months to Diana. He'd had, you know, anonymous notes posted at the Mutega Club saying there's no fool like an old fool. So you can do one of two things. You can either put on a brave face and pretend to support this, you know, catastrophe actually for him that the marriage had broken up in a couple of months. Um, or, or, or you could behave as any red-blooded male would and, and you know, ask uh, Joss Errol for a duel. Um, he chose the former. He chose to put on a brave face. Jock was an enormous fan of horse racing, and he would use a horse racing metaphor to describe the fact that he had lost Diana to Errol. He said, I cut my losses. He knew that physically and probably in bed, he could not compete with Errol and could not bring Diana the sexual satisfaction she clearly desired and received from Errol. And Jock was aware of this, knew his own shortcomings in that department and decided to try and do the gentlemanly thing. On the night the Earl of Errol died, Errol, Broughton, Lady Broughton, 
and June Carberry all had dinner together in the Mathega Club, uh, as if nothing awful was happening. And Jock made a toast, saying to Joss and Diana, I wish them every happiness in the future, and may their union be blessed with an heir. The end of the dinner in the Mathega Club, Broughton and June Carberry stayed on at the club to drink. And that's odd in itself, because Broughton wasn't, wasn't usually a drinker. Errol uh, and Lady Broughton went off to a nearby Nairobi nightclub to go dancing, because she loved dancing. Uh, and it was agreed that after the evening was over, the Earl of Errol would drive Diana back to Broughton's house in the Nairobi suburb of Karen. Um, now, Errol is as good as his word and, and brings Diana back by half past two in the morning. Errol drove Diana back home and escorted her into the house. After saying his goodbyes, he returned to his car to make the journey back. What happened next has never been fully explained. All that is known for certain is that early the next morning, a local dairy worker made a shocking discovery at a remote crossroads just two miles from Sir Jock and Diana's house. It was Lord Errol. His body slumped inside the car with what seemed to be a bullet wound to the side of his head. The police were called to the scene, but they found no witnesses. And what little forensic evidence there was had been lost to a series of mistakes during their recovery. I think that there was quite a botched situation. They took the car into a garage in Nairobi, by which time everybody's fingerprints were upon it. A lot of evidence had been destroyed all around the car scene. Everybody's footprints. It's really important for a crime scene to be left untouched because anybody that goes into it could alter it and could change the evidence for the investigators to look at later in the future. All that now remained of the evidence were the bullets from the 32 caliber murder weapon, gunpowder residue on Errol's face, and a series of scuff marks in the back of the car. They were the Kenyan police, and they were dealing with a colonial murder of an Earl. Um, so there would have been certain protocols and not stepping on certain feet, and it would have been incredibly sensitive um, for the Kenyan police to be, you know, sort of sticking their noses into a world that um, the white settlers would have said was above them. Due to the press attention that the crime received, the police were under increasing pressure to find the murderer. But surprisingly, the first suspect to be investigated was not Sir John, but one of Errol's former lovers, Alice de Jonze. Alice de Jonze was a most interesting character, a very glamorous young American married to a French count she was a friend of Idina and Joss, and she and her first husband, Count Frederick de Janze, came out to visit Idina and Joss and 
decided they liked the Happy Valley lifestyle so much, or Alice certainly did. I think he was more of a respectable count, but Alice loved all the wild parties and everything, and they bought a small farm, one Johi farm, not far away from Slane's, where Idina and Errol were. Alice de Jeanze was called the Wicked Madonna by the Happy Valley set, and, and by their standards, that's really saying something. In what is now a school in the Kenyan town of Gilgil, stands all that is left of Alice de Jeanze's former house. But back when Alice lived here, you would have got a very different kind of education. Alice and her husband, Count Frederick de Janze, lived here while they were building the main house. It would have been wild parties. Alice, Alice did drugs quite seriously. But she was obviously a great party animal and probably like Idina, I think she was quite cultured and well-read and good conversation and good fun. Her biographer certainly says there was a very manic depressive side to her and she used to get very unhappy, very black moods. Local conservationist Solomon Gitau grew up on Alice's farm. He knew many of her servants and remembers the stories that they told him about what happened at the house. He is in no doubt that Alice de Jeanze was Lord Errol's murderer. To me, she is the first suspect. I think by that because Alice was very jealous. And one day, Alice was very upset. I don't know the reason why he was, she was upset about, and when she was in the kitchen, he started uh, complaining about Lodell and say, one day I shall kill him. Suspicion first fell on Alice when she was reported to have acted very strangely when viewing Errol's body at the mortuary. Alice did something very unusual after Errol's death. She went to the morgue to view his body. She kissed Errol on the lips. And told him now he was hers forever. I think probably that helped to make her a suspect. But the police's main reason for questioning Alice was that it would not have been the first time she had shot someone. Alice de Janze was pulled in for one very simple reason. She had previous. Uh, a few years before, she had got out a pistol in the Gare du Nord in Paris and shot her lover and also shot herself in the stomach. Now. Neither of them died, but it was clear that this was a woman who was very happy to shoot people. Countess de Janze had made headlines around the world for the shooting of her lover, Raymond de Traffin. Raymond survived, and Alice was handed a suspended sentence on the grounds of her diminished mental state. That previous conviction alone was enough to put her in the frame. Could Alice have been responsible for Errol's murder? She admitted that she had done the deed, and she also wrote in, a, in a, the ply leaf of a book that she had done it. But she was um, a bit addled at the time, and uh, I don't think the police believed her. They didn't see how she could have been at the scene of the crime at the corner and shot him. And how did she know when he would be passing by in the car? And how would she get there? So I think they just dismissed it as uh, insubstantial evidence, not to be trusted. 
The investigation into Alice de Jonze ceased when she was able to provide an alibi. The focus of the investigation was then swiftly moved to Sir Jock Broughton. Bearing in mind it was, I think, seven weeks after the Earl was shot that Jock Delves Broughton was arrested and charged with the murder, um, which seems to be an inordinately long time to come to the obvious suspect because um, various members of the Happy Valley sect did blab, you know, and did say that it, he didn't take it quite as well as people expected or, or, or people thought that he, that he took to his wife being stolen by the Earl of Errol. Um, so I'm only surprised he wasn't arrested immediately. Sir Jock was taken into custody and tried for the murder of Lord Errol. During the proceedings, his defense argued that June Carberry had stayed at Sir Jock's house that night and confirmed that she had seen him at home at 3.30 a.m., just one hour after the murder had taken place. They also tried to suggest that Jock had hidden in the back of the car and shot Errol and then walked back, and it's actually quite a distance to walk. And they brought in a lot of medical evidence about how it would have taken him two hours to walk back to the house. Plus, if June Carberry is to be believed, he was very drunk that night. So it's all just so unlikely. Unable to place him at the scene of the crime, the prosecution now needed to link Sir Jock to the murder weapon. He had reported the theft of two of his revolvers two days before the murder uh, without any sign of a break-in at his house, which suggested to the police that he may have been setting up an alibi for why he didn't have the gun anymore. The prosecution went back to the evidence recovered from the crime scene and tried to make a match. The police case against Jock Broughton rested on one crucial thing, which was that the bullet that had killed the Earl of Errol matched the striation marks that showed up on other bullets that had, that had been fired from Broughton's gun previously. The police had picked up some old bullets that Broughton had fired and they had compared them and they could, were convinced that the marks were the same and that, therefore it was Broughton's gun that had killed Errol. But the prosecution were no match for Sir Jock's experienced legal team. Morris, the, the lawyer that Diana had hired to defend Jock, was a ballistic expert. Broughton's lawyer was able to prove in court that the bullet that killed Errol had not come from any coat revolver. The case collapsed and he walked from court a free man. To this day, no one has ever been convicted for the murder of the Earl of Errol, and the case remains unsolved. There was one person, however, who claimed they knew exactly who had done it. Juanita Carberry was just 15 years old at the time of the murder. She was the stepdaughter of June Carberry, one of Jock's and Diana's close friends, who was with them at the Mothega Club the night of the murder. She claims to have visited Jock with her stepmother, June, on the day that Errol's body was discovered. Juanita was left with Jock, and apparently she asked him if he wanted to go and see her horse. When she was taking him to see her horse, um, he confessed to her that he had actually done the crime. But apparently when 
June Carberry found out about this, she swore Anita's a secrecy. She did seem absolutely genuine about it. I couldn't see why she was making it up. But Juanita also witnessed something else that day. The story about Jock Delves Broughton um, lighting a bonfire at home the morning after the Earl of Errol had been found. She said that she went into the garden and saw Jock burning these white plimsolls on a fire in the garden. What reason did Jock have for wanting to destroy a pair of his shoes? The evidence they gathered was that the um, in the back of the car there were a lot of white scuff marks. Now, people wore what we used to call tackies, which are white plimsolls, and we used to make them white with blanco which scuffed off on any surface, actually. You get white scuff marks. They found a lot of those in the back of the car. If we take a white sports shoe and mark it on leather, quite often it'll leave a white mark on the leather itself. So we'd advise people investigating the crime scene that there may well have been some shoes with shoe whitener present at the crime scene. If those were Sir Jock's shoes that made the scuff marks in the back of Errol's car, surely it proves that he was indeed the murderer. But what about his defense in court, which conclusively proved that he would not have had time to shoot Errol and walk back to his house by 3.30 a.m.? Christine Nichols is an author who grew up in Kenya in the 1940s. Christine began looking into the murder for a book she was writing, and her research turned up an unexpected piece of evidence. The new information that came up was in the tape of Dan Trench. Maxwell Trench had told his son, Dan, that he knew about the murder. Dan Trench was born in Kenya in 1919. His parents were close friends with June Carberry, who had apparently divulged to Dan's father exactly what had happened that night. Two tapes here, the originals. Well, I've, I've kept them at home here because they're quite in, inflammatory, what's said on the tape. Well, Dan claims that his father had told him that Delves Broughton had had a lift back from the murder scene to his house and that the chap who had given him the lift was an ear, nose, throat and eye specialist in Nairobi called Athan Philip who lived nearby. Dan Trench gave the interview in 1986 on the agreement that it would only be released after his death. This Dr. Philip had a house the other side of the road. My father told me to the ranch in Broughton, the ranch in Philip, to be there in certain places to pick him up and drive him back immediately to the drive of the house. The murder took place just over two miles from Broughton's home. Broughton, in court, pointed out that he was an old man and had a walking problem. He claimed that he couldn't possibly have shot Errol and then walked all the way home uh, and been in bed, uh, and that it was just physically impossible. Did the job, get in the car, get in the car. Was driving and just jumping at the gate and he's back in the house. So that's the alibi. You and I are the only two people in the world of murder. So that means that Dan Broughton definitely did do it and he did it himself. Yeah. It's a secret. I promise it's a secret. Yeah. 
with both Dan Trench and Dr. Athan Philip having passed away. Is there any way to verify the contents of this tape? Well, um, it does name somebody as implicated in the murder, and um, he's dead now, he can't speak for himself. His daughter doesn't believe what's been said. Um, so it is really very difficult to decide whether this is true or not. Dan Trench certainly believed what he said was true. If we are to believe the evidence against Sir Jock Delves Broughton, it would seem clear that he was indeed guilty of Errol's murder. But how did he do it? At about 2.30, Errol returns back to the Delves Broughton house, bringing back, as he promised, Diana. Errol then gets into his car, his Buick. But unbeknown to him, there's someone in the back, and that person is Sir John, who's waiting and waiting for his moment. And the Buick is driving along on the road back to Nairobi. And just as the car approaches a junction, Delves Broughton pulls out his pistol and shoots him, and shoots him dead. Does the new evidence conclusively prove once and for all who really killed Jocelyn Hay, the 22nd Earl of Errol? I'm quite sure that Jock Broughton killed the Earl of Errol. Who else knew where Errol was in the small hours of the morning on a dark road in the middle of Africa? Broughton was the only man who knew he was there. Of course he did it. I think it's been conclusively proved that Doc Delves Broughton did shoot the Earl of Errol, um, that he was helped to and from the scene of the crime, that he wasn't drunk. It suggests with the, the alleged burglary, you know, the theft of the gun two days before, and the um, increased heavy drinking two or three days before, that he decided quite suddenly that he was going to kill the Earl of Errol, but that he'd given it two or three days and found the opportunity and, and set it up. I don't know who killed um, the Earl of Errol. I really don't. I suspect it might have been uh, Dells Broughton. Could have been Diana. Could have been Dejeance. No one involved in the case ever spoke about it publicly after the trial. And it seems that in Happy Valley, one tragedy follows another. Alice committed suicide. She made two attempts and the second one was successful. She shot herself, but first she made up her bed with her best linen, which had the family crest on it. And she filled her room with flowers and she shot herself, and this time she was successful. She requested a cocktail party be held at her grave, but unfortunately there weren't many people around, so it never happened. But even though he was found not guilty of the murder, the court case had proved too scandalous, and Jock returned to England in disgrace shortly afterwards. Well, Jock Delves Broughton's story is, uh, has a very sad end, that he almost limps back from Nairobi to the United Kingdom, and he killed himself in a hotel in Liverpool, of all places, and it was an injection of morphine uh, that finished him off, which, again, strongly suggests that he was the killer of the Earl of Errol. He had medical issues, he wasn't very well, uh, and he left two notes when he died, one to say that he couldn't stand the physical pain of his illnesses anymore, 
And the other was to say that he couldn't stand any more strain about the trial. Uh, and in my opinion, killing himself was the last act of a guilty man. As for Lady Diana, she stayed on in Kenya, marrying a further two times before her death in 1987, aged 76. I think Diana's grief was genuine after, after her lover was killed. But amazingly enough, she actually remarried quite soon afterwards. She married Gilbert Colville, who was uh, an eccentric, rather reclusive farmer, very big landowner, very nice man, apparently. And she married him, and they were very happily married for 12 years. And she then married again his best friend, who was Lord Delamere, the fourth Baron Delamere, and she became Lady Delamere. So she got what she wanted, which was a lot of money, a lot of land, and titles, which was what people said Diana was always after, although I'm sure there was more to Diana than that. There is now little to remind us of the hedonistic lives once lived in these picturesque Kenyan landscapes. But the murder of the Earl of Errol continues to fascinate through the generations. I don't think we'll ever find out what happened to the Earl of Errol. Uh, it's too long ago. Not enough evidence was gathered at the time. The prosecution was botched and it's too late to find out anything now but people but it will run and run this story people will continue to have theories because it's interesting exciting mm -hmm.